Good evening uh, and welcome to this evening's Lundy webinar, the first of 2021. I'm Michael Williams and I'm Secretary of the Lundy Field Society. Uh, I'm coming to you live from a virtual Morisco Tavern as usual this evening, uh, but I, in reality, uh, I'm at home uh, in Cambridge. Tonight, I'm going to be joined by John Tyra, who's going to speak to us about uh, photographing Lundy. Uh, he's been on Lundy over Christmas uh, and has taken some really dramatic photos of the weather. So John's going to talk to us about, so he's going to show us some of the photos that he's taken. Uh, he's also going to run through a couple of uh, tutorials and workshops on uh, how, he, how he edits his photos. So uh, slightly different format this evening, which I'm really looking forward to. But before we get on to all of that, I'm going to run through the housekeeping arrangements. Uh, if you're a regular viewer, then please do make yourself comfortable while I go through uh, the usual announcement. We won't be able to see or hear any of you at home as only the microphones and video cameras on John's computer and my computer are enabled. As ever, Dave Richards is behind the scenes hosting the Zoom session. A recording will be available afterwards. And if you're watching on Zoom, you can ask questions using the Q&A function. Just click the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and then type your question into the box that pops up. If you're on a mobile or tablet, then you can find it on the menu bar and you don't need to wait until the end of the talk. You can put your question in at any time. There's also a chat feature for comments and feedback, which Dave and I will be monitoring during the talk. I can see there's already a few messages come in. Uh, welcome also to our viewers on YouTube. Uh, hopefully the YouTube connection is working. We we're having a few issues earlier on. Uh, but I'm afraid if you're watching on YouTube, there's no facility for you to ask questions. So without further ado, I will introduce our speaker. Hopefully John is there. Yep. I hope so too. Can you hear me? I can hear you, John. Yeah, I can't see you yet. Okay. Uh, there we go. I can deal. see you now. How is that? Okay. That's very good. It's very good. Right. So I'm just going to I'm just going to give a brief introduction, a brief biographical introduction to you, John, and then I'll hand over. Right, you are. So, uh, John John is an art and photography teacher in an Exeter secondary school, uh, and over the past ten years, he has captured tens of thousands of seascapes and landscapes of the island and its wildlife. He is a regular contributor to published works uh, of, about Lundy and you will soon be able to buy some of his pictures in the Lundy general stores. Great to have you here, John. Uh, you've already started sharing your screen, which is great. So uh, over to you. Okay, thanks, Michael. Right, um, the last one of these we did was way back and it was about six, seven months ago, it seems. It seems like a million years, but it was what? Last year. Um, like a lot of people, uh, I got cancelled from a trip or two, uh, but I was really lucky. So I managed to get across uh, for what was going to be four days in December, and it ended up being 11, which was really great. And it just gave me the chance to, you know, not photograph Lundy in you know spring and summer when the weather is what you'd expect hopefully but just to go out in the drama uh of the wind and the rain uh and it was quite a challenge on a couple of days to get out the door and i think we've kind of all been there but i'll chat a bit uh, about the photos that i've got here from that trip the photograph you're looking at now on the screen is from about four or five years ago but there's one from december that's incredibly similar and that's one we're going to do a little editing demo on in a bit right let's see if i can get to the next slide right so helicopter and that was if you've been on the helicopter that was the pilot sitting in the morisco drinking coffee waiting for the mist to clear. And I just thought, oh, I'll nip out. Uh, unusually, it was both windy and foggy. And there's the evidence. So some of you might know where that's taken from. Um, lots of you won't, but it's actually from outside Old Lake Cottage. So there's the chimney 
that almost looks as big as the old light itself. Okay, again in fog, and people might think, oh, why do you want to take a picture in fog? Well, it's different. And, and once I've got those images up on my computer screen, I want them to look like it was when I was there. So if my camera was set on auto, the camera would automatically uh, decide to make for a really bright image. And I thought, no, I just want it to look like it was when I was there. There we go. Some of you know that place. In fact, there's a whole Facebook group just dedicated to Old Light Cottage. Uh, and that photo kind of sums it up. It was taken the same time. It was really cold. It was windy and it was really misty and it looked so isolated all by itself. I couldn't decide if that should be black and white. I tried a black and white version and in the end I thought, nah, it just needs to be colour really. One of the things that always gets people when they see pictures of old light cottage is the proximity, proximity of uh, gravestones you know, in the cemetery next door. Okay, walking down to the landing beach and suddenly you know, the sky just changed. It was pretty much the last light of the day. It always good. The first light of the day and the last light of the day is just brilliant for photography. So with that one, as the sun was kind of doing its thing and disappearing, it just caught a cloud and gave it that really lovely orangey, pinky, peachy colour. So, yeah, that's what I was trying to capture. Again, if my camera was set to auto, it would have automatically thought, oh, this is daylight, this is where it has to be. So it wouldn't have had those range of tones and colours. Okay, let's see what we got next. I don't know about you people out there, but when the weather's dramatic, I always end up looking up and looking at the sky and photographing the sky. So you'll all recognize what that thing is in the bottom. But as for a sky, a dramatic sky, a swirly sky, you've got to be so quick. Uh, and you've got to be lucky, but you've got to be there. And one of the advantages of bad weather, I always think, is that you know it's going to change second by second. And I say bad weather, you know, with bad in inverted commas. In terms of winter, and these photos are all taken in winter, and they were all taken two weeks ago, you've kind of got it easy because if you're out with a camera, you don't have to be out all day to see the dawn and sunset because you've got, what well, I don't know how many hours between sunrise, but sunrise in the middle of the, the shortest day, sunrise is about 10 to 8. And the sun goes down about 4.30. So you haven't got long to wait. If that was summer, well, you're talking about not sleeping at all. You'd have to get up at stupid o'clock. And then, you know, you'd still be there at 10 o'clock at night waiting for things to happen. And speaking of waiting for things to happen, if you've been to Lundy in the winter, you've kind of been hanging about at that particular point. Uh, and we were lucky. We'd been cancelled or postponed the day before because the weather was so bad. So that was Saturday the 19th. And while I was hanging around and waiting for the helicopter to get me over to the island, I do what I always do, and I hope other people do too. And in fact, I know you do, because I've spoken to a lot of you. It's just wander about, killing time with the camera, you know, mooching around. And always when the helicopter comes in, I always point my camera at that, because I think we all do. But I always try and get a picture of the place where I'm kind of I'm kind of heading for. So just at the point where I was doing that, again, the sky, because it was such a windy day, the sky and Mother Nature did her wonderful thing. So I was just able to snap it. Uh, and again, when it came to the camera settings, it was a dark, rainy day. So I wanted to convey that in the photo. Right, I've been trying to get that one for ages. Uh, and I've seen it before, maybe on the cover of a book. Um, but again, you know, a brief flash of sunlight on tibbets, but the background was still dark, or the sky was still dark. And tibbets, when I took that picture, I'd met the people who were staying there. In fact, it was only one person. And it was one chap on his own, and he'd been there five days. I thought, wow, that must be absolutely amazing to stay in tibbets on your own, gaslit. That incredible walk back at night after the Morisco, and I asked him about it. Um, 
And he said, well, the walk only takes 25 minutes. Somehow, I think it might take me longer. Okay. I'm speaking of crosses. Uh, I've used a fill-in flash on my camera to illuminate the cross and the tobacco sky. I don't know if you're allowed to say tobacco these days, but that sky, um, maybe an hour or two before sunset, I can't remember now, um, but fairly bog standard. But I like that image because it just showed the emptiness of it all. And I kind of liked uh, behind the cross, there is a tomb or a gravestone with a cross on it and the sunlight has just caught the cross on top of it. Let's see what's next. Okay, uh, well, the weather's a bit rough. And as I said earlier, people kind of look at the sky. I do, I look at the sea as well. And if we're really lucky, the sunbeams come flying through. So that one um, was taken round about um, Shutter Point, Shutter Rocks. And don't know if you can see it, spot the helicopter. There's the helicopter coming in. Uh, kind of top middle towards the left but for me it was all about those clouds the delicacy of them and the sunlight playing on the sea and one of the things that always gets me about Lundy is you know when you're on the east coast you're looking at the Bristol Channel and when you're on the west coast you're looking at the Atlantic I always think that's amazing right let me see if I can scroll forward and the same with that. It's not the last night light of the day. And you can see the sunbeams bashing down on the sea. Uh, and that is the west side. So that's the Atlantic we're looking at now. Um, but I've deliberately made it darker just to give it drama. Okay. And we'll look at that again in a bit. Okay. Next one. Right then. So I don't like talking technical. And in terms of free software and, pro and Photoshop, it's confusing and you have to learn it one step at a time. And when I teach you, it is one step at a time. You know, we might spend a whole lesson just doing one or two particular tools. But I'm going to kind of contradict myself by chucking all of that out the window now and doing a demo I'm going to do a demo on Photoshop before I, I get into it. I'm just going to ask you to look at the top there and that whole scroll of numbers and letters is your link to Adobe Photoshop free trial. But if you Google Adobe Photoshop free trial, you'll find it anyway. Okay, so it's the same image we just saw and that's a print screen or a screenshot. So you'll basically see what I did to it. Okay, next one. So this is a demo and it's going to take about eight minutes. Okay, so what you're looking at is a recording of or a live view of my Photoshop screen. So I've opened up Photoshop, so the PS icon, then I've dragged and dropped uh, the image that you've just seen on my PowerPoint, the previous slide, I've drag, dragged and dropped that in. And what I'm looking to do is give this image a little bit more drama. So I was in the right place at the right time, um, deliberately, because I kind of planned to be there uh, for the last hour of sunlight or the last hour of daylight. And uh, luckily, you know, I waited for the sunbeams kind of to appear, and they did. So, first thing we're going to show you is down here is the toolbar and these two set squares, crop tool. So, I'll click on that and now I can do anything with it. Now, I'm mindful that all the action or the drama is in the central part of the picture. So, that's what I'm going to focus on. Sorry about the pun. But I'm also aware that each time that I crop an image, I'm taking away quality. So if I'm losing 50% of its area, I'm also losing 50% of its pixels. Now, if you watch what I've just done, I've kind of messed up a couple of times. And 
and I might play around with that. On a good day, I might play around with that and go back to it over and over until I think, yeah, that's what it needs to look like. For the sake of this demo, I'm doing it really quickly, but I, I have edited this thing before. So when I am happy, ticky boxy thing up there, click on that. Okay. Over here, navigator, so I can zoom in. I can zoom out. Right. So as I said before, I want to give it a bit of drama. I could leave it as it is, but my feeling is it needs a wider range of tones. So not color, but tones. So between light and dark, you know, between white and black are a load of gray tones. If this was a black and white image. So I've got no, no blacks in there at all. In terms of white, yeah, probably down here. And that's probably it. So the most complicated thing on Photoshop you can ever imagine is this curves. And if suddenly you're thinking, whoa, what is he doing there? It doesn't matter because this will be out there on YouTube and you can download the vid or watch the vid and you can stop and start it at each point when you think, whoa, what's going on there? Now, I teach this professionally uh, as part of my job as a school teacher, an art teacher and a photography teacher. And I'm a great advocate for you know, one step at a time, step by step, because the way I learn is one step at a time. Otherwise, I get utterly bamboozled, frustrated, and I lose heart. Uh, but I'm going against that just for the sake of this quick demo. But you can stop and start the vid. Right. So while I was waffling on, I've opened up the curves box, and that's complicated. So we've got a diagonal happening. Behind that, we've got like a graph. So this area here, where my little pointy thing represents black. The opposite side represents white. This diagonal, we'll play with that in a minute. The graph behind represents all the tones, not colors, all the tones the lights and the darks in the image. So if that's black, this tells me here, there is no black in my image. If this area here is white, that graph tells me there is no white. So I'm gonna go for a broader range of tones and I'm quickly, and I can pin this in place, but I'm gonna look for a letter S shape. Well, that's nice, but is it believable? So maybe I will take it a bit further up to there. If you're happy, press OK. If you're not happy, you can either press cancel or you can play around with it. And right now, it's definitely, definitely going the wrong way. And right now, it's gone the right way but there's no subtlety in there at all. What I want my images to be is believable and as realistic as possible, as I remembered the experience of actually being there on the west side at that point on a freezing cold late afternoon. So maybe I'll press OK with that. But maybe I want still a broader range of tones. So I can go back, image adjustments, calves and this time you'll see the graph has changed a bit I'll pull it down again and again remember that this area represents black this area represents white so I've just put two pins in place this time it might be too contrasty and for me it is because remember I want a broad range of tones. Okay, so I might leave her at that for now. There we go. What else can I do to it? Well, I can do anything to it, but for the sake of this demonstration, I much, might just decide on color. Again, I want it to be real. All of these changes and edits you can kind of do in camera but you've got more control 
on something like Photoshop and that just looks hideous. So we're looking for subtlety. So maybe, maybe that is okay. Hue, what a funny word. And it does really bonkers things. So I'll keep it where we started and I'll press OK for that. All right. Now, I've decided that I'm happy with that image. I might want to, I might want to get that printed as a canvas print. Uh, I might want to keep it to make a book. I might want it for whatever reason to send to whoever or put it on social media. But if I'm going to re-edit that picture, I want to edit the original, not this version. So I'm going to do a file and I'm not going to do a save. I'm going to do a save as. Save as. And now it's number 32. So I might call it 32B or C or D. I'll call it 32V2 for version 2. And I'm going to save it in a particular place. And I'll know exactly where I'm saving the pictures. Otherwise, and this happens in school the whole time, students are always saying, oh, sir, I can't find my picture. It's gone. Something's happened. And it isn't gone. They just didn't take note of where to save it. So, okay. Right. So, uh, I hope you managed to get through that. Okay, right, can you hear me? Yep, perfect. Yeah, we can hear I you, John. All right, I hope you managed to sit through that. Uh, if there was too much happening, it will be on YouTube, and so you can stop and start it, you know, to your heart's desire, or you can not look at it at all. But in terms of step-by-step, -step, you can stop your video. You can watch it. You can stop the video. Okay. So that was a free demo of Photoshop, or rather that was a demo of free Photoshop. Your, your free Photoshop is only going to last a week. So if you want something that's going to last forever, on the top of the screen there, pixelr.com forward slash E. Uh, that's free. And it's a Photoshop copy. It's not brilliant. But things are kind of in the, the same place. And when I say it's not brilliant, it does the same stuff. It's just a bit clunky. And you will find adverts popping up. Um, but it doesn't cost anything. Right now, during lockdown, my students are using Pixel R. Right, equipment. Uh, I bought a GoPro. And it was uh, 200 quid, second hand. And then I bought another GoPro because they were just brilliant for uh, time lapse. But they're also fabulous for still images. And I'll show you one of the still images in a bit. Pictures you've seen also from me on here are taken with my phone, with a compact camera or with a DSLR. Most are taken with a DSLR for no particular reason other than I've been using a DSLR for 15 years and before that an SLR for probably about another 25, 30. So each camera, and I said this way back in May, each camera has advantages and disadvantages or each camera format. And if you are going to Lundy in the winter or wherever you're going, think about a GoPro because they're waterproof. Okay. And you can drop them and they bounce. Right. Speaking of bouncing, that was a mega, mega day. I did a whole sequence of that. That is behind the diver's shed. It's full color, but the way the sunlight was meant that there was no color in that image at all. That's one of a sequence of maybe 10 pictures that I took of the wave, the seventh wave, is it the ninth wave? I forget, uh, breaking over the rocks. Just looking out with Rat Island on the left, and that's Mouse Island kind of to the left as well. And that's the rocks just to the right of Mouse Island. And it was just a mega day, really blew the cobwebs away. Uh, same day, you know, and as often, the landing bay and the landing beach completely sheltered and covered in mist. West side again, uh, the cheeses, last light of the day. So I probably had about 20 minutes of, you know, daylight to, to get snapping. 
uh, and I just watched the light change and I watched the, the subtle sunlight on the sea and I just thought, wow, doesn't that just look immense? Uh, and I was lucky enough to get some pictures before it really got too dark. Okay. And that really was a cold day. East side, sunbeams, not coming through the clouds this time, but kind of coming through the east side. So we're all familiar with that view. And as often happens, if it's really windy on the west side, then you might actually think about spending your day on the east side. So that particular day, uh, I'd walked on the top path on the east side. I'd had my lunch at VC Quarry. Uh, and then I just carried on. And as it turned out, I actually ended up at the North Light or the North Light landing stage. And it was just an amazing mega day. And there we go. That's not the image you saw, you saw at the start. That was two weeks ago. Okay. The second vid is coming up and is shorter. And it's just about black and white. I think the purposes of time that I might actually skip the second bit, but I will play some of it, the beginning bit I will play you. Right, so let's imagine I've already done my editing with this. In fact, I already have. Uh, but what I want to do with this one, because I can't decide if I like it in color, I'm going to see what it looks like in black and white. So there's a couple of ways I can do that, but the only way to do it with, with real quality is back to the top image adjustments black and white and straight away i'm confronted and the word is confronted with confusing sliders but really i'm only going to use red yellow possibly green uh, and maybe cyan and blue but we'll find out when we get there the most important thing to do right now is to remember the starting value so red starts at 40 percent i can take it right down and it will go really dark and the dark bits will go blotchy similarly i can take it right up and i don't know if you can see that uh, but i can see it so where were we 40. so what i'm looking at and kind of the key word that i've been using tonight is drama so i'm looking for added drama so maybe to achieve that I'm going to try and go for a broader range of tones in the rocks and the cliffs and the land. And maybe the sky is going to be a bit darker. Maybe the sea is going to be a bit more darker. That might give it some drama. Let's find out. So if I take up red, and I know from experience that red will slightly lighten the rocks. And it's done that. I don't want to go too far. Let's leave it round about around about 100-ish. Same with yellow, let's see what happens. Okay, too much. So let's take it down quite a bit. What's gonna happen with green? Not a lot, but I'm gonna take it up anyway. Cyan, yeah, it's gonna really blotchy. Okay, I don't wanna go too far the other way because the same thing will happen. But I have taken it down only a tiny bit. With blue, the same thing should happen, and it does. So, I've kind of left it where it is. I'm not even going to bother with magenta, because I know with magenta, nothing will happen. Right, so if I'm happy with that, and I may not be, because I might decide to start again, I've pressed OK. OK. So, what am I going to do now? Back to curves again which is the tool, if you're a landscape photographer, it's the tool you're going to be using for 80 or 90% of your time in Photoshop or Pixel R. So from the first vid, you know that black is down here and white is up there. And you know that this graph represents all the tones in my image. And while I'm faffing, I'm wondering if you all know where the image was taken. So really stormy day, freezing cold. This was two weeks ago, so between Christmas, Christmas and New Year. And I'd gone down to the battery with the intention of doing a time lapse, but it was so windy 
and so cold it wasn't going to happen. So I did do some film footage, uh, but no more than like three minutes. And while I was there, I thought, nah, I need to get a still photo of this as well, uh, which ended up being really similar to one that I'd done about four or five years ago, uh, roughly the same time of year. Right, proof that I can't multitask, because as I'm talking to you, I'm getting nowhere with this edit. So back to the beginning. So both of those output and input on zero. Let's pull it down to make it darker. I've pinned it in place. Let's push it up around the mid-tones. Okay. I don't know what I think. Let's take it down again there. Let's take it down again there. I'm going to stop because you people out there can play around with this to your heart's content. And you know what? You'll know that you're getting into it because you'll never be satisfied and you'll never be sure. So like I said earlier, just save different versions. Don't save, do a save as. Right, for the purpose of time, I'm going to stop that there. So I'm going to press OK. All right. Now then, uh, one more thing I want to show you is that... Where are we? Adjustments, color balance. Now you're thinking there's no color in that picture. Um, but back in the old days of old money and dark rooms and photographic paper, you could buy different types of photographic paper. Some had warm tones, some had cold tones, some were neutral. So I, tr I tend to or try to replicate that. So I can warm my picture up by adding red. And to me, that looks like kind of faux or fake sepia. So let's go back to zero. I can warm it up using yellow. I don't want to use too much. But what I tend to do is I tend to do maybe minus four or minus five on yellow. And I might bung in plus one or plus two on red at the same time. So I think I'll leave it at that. OK. So OK, up here file, save as, so you've got your version, call it version 2 or 3 or BW for black and white, whatever, but then you might want to go back and do another version. So, back to colour balance, this time cooler tones. So back in the old days there was a really hard to get photographic paper called Kodak Elite, and people used to have to travel to London to buy it, I can remember doing that as a student. But for something like this, it was absolutely stunning because it was full of silver halide crystals and the quality was just incredible. And as much as I think digital is far better than film, there's something missing with digital and it's the quality of the paper. Anyway, uh, I think I might like that, but I'm not sure because like I said earlier, you know, I can't decide. I can only decide, and you'll only decide with your images over time. So when you go back to them, and you reopen them, and you look at them, and you play around with them, that's when you're really learning the nuances of the visual language. And speaking of visual language, theory says that if I darken the outside to some degree, and I don't know how many pixels you've got to play with in your image, but I know that this image here had 21.9 million pixels because it was taken with a Nikon D500. So not the most pixels in the camera, but it's lots to do with quality of pixels. So the rule says that if I darken the outside of the image, and I don't have to around here because it's already dark because of the vignetting of the cheapo lens it was using. So let's go to there. Select, inverse. So really, it's the sky I'm after attacking. Again, like I said in the previous vid, I don't want to make it look really obvious. I want subtlety. You know, the imagination has to kind of fill in the gaps. So that to me looks awful. But maybe that looks okay. So I'll leave it there, select, deselect, file, 
same as twenty four V nine because I might have had eight different versions. Who knows? Anyway, like I said earlier, save it to size twelve. I've no idea what format options is, but somebody told me when I was learning Photoshop to go for the bottom one progressive. No idea why, but I've always done it. And OK, and there you are, done. OK, don't know if you can hear me. Start my video. Yep, right, hopefully you can hear me. And we're on the home straight. So St. Helen's Church. I always take a picture of St. Helen's Church. I always end up going back and doing more. And I went back the very next morning. And somebody had painted it overnight. So for that, it's like, well, it's pink, it's orange, it's salmon. And that was about eight o'clock in the morning, maybe a bit before, and the sun was coming up. And the incredible sunrise was whacking the side of the church. And making it that colour. And I found myself scurrying down uh, to the square outside the castle. And there was the view. I wasn't the only person who'd raced out. Uh, there was a person from Barnstable who found her way uh, to Benson's Cave. I was happy staying where I was. It looks like a, a summer morning. It wasn't. It was really freezing. But it was just magical. And I thought, wow, this is Christmas Day. And I'm so lucky. So lucky to be on Lundy. And I looked back as the sun came up on the east side and just got this magical golden brown thing, uh, which couldn't or didn't pick up in the sky. So the sky stayed its normal colour, as did the sea. But the land and the rock just became this wonderful autumnal colour. And that was the one. I thought, wow. I wonder if the people staying in those properties actually know what the castle looks like right now. And to me, it was just stupendous. Uh, and the clouds really helped as well, because those clouds are kind of swirling and swirling away into the distance. But that was just a mega fabulous day. And that would be, yeah, I guess, eight o'clock Christmas morning. Utterly wonderful to be there. And you know, this is why I love sharing my Lundy pictures with people who know Lundy. Right. Um, sheep. A lot of sheep on Lundy. Again, you know, my picture, the weather was, or the, the day was dark, so there was no reason to set the camera to auto because I wanted the picture to look like the scene. Same with that. Again, you know, if you want to be lucky, you've got to make your own look. And that just kind of happened in front of me. Uh, the weather was rough. And there was a little, what well, you can see, that little blue bit of sky. Uh, but the rain is piling in from the left. And just at that point, there was a rainbow. Looking at the sky again. I'm not one for looking at things or shapes in clouds. But that one did strike me. There's my portable sheep, and sheep in the spotlight. Uh, lucky again, you know, as the sun just piled through onto the Atlantic, not, not onto the land. And I was hoping it would come onto the land, but it didn't. It just kind of disappeared as quick as it had appeared. And that's one of the beauties of the landscape or the seascape. I wondered if the people stay in and Hamners knew there was somebody outside taking pictures. Um, it was the light from the windows I thought would make the picture. And again, it was getting on it well into dusk. So there wasn't much daylight left. It was just a great day. Let me go again. If you're wondering what the light is from the old light, it's the reflection from the sun coming from the west side and the last bit of sunlight from the day. Totally different, almost abstract. You know, minute by minute, your weather changes more in winter than it ever can in summer. 
Right, I said earlier that I was going to show you an image with the GoPro, uh, and that's it. And it's straight out the camera. It's not edited. And if you look at the, the horizon, it's uh, curved, almost like a fisheye lens, and that's the nature of a GoPro. You can correct that on Photoshop or Pixel R. Um, but I tend to leave it as it is because, well, you're not going to get many vistas or images as wide as that. So that was taken on the steps going up to South Light. Right. Have we got? There we go. So we kind of started with a helicopter picture and we kind of end up with a helicopter picture. You know, time to go back. A wonderful time on the island, as always. Um, but there you go. Right. So that's the last slide. Uh, the one you can see on the right is the unedited, unedited version. And the one you can see below is edited. So if you look at uh, the YouTube video of this later, probably be on there from tomorrow, uh, you can look at the links. So if you want to see another tutorial uh, to show how I edited the image top right to the larger image bottom left, then that will be on there in a couple of days time. I'll put it out there, but feel free to email me. There's my email address. Okay. Uh, then I've written or on Facebook. And then I forgot to write my name. But if you look on Facebook, uh, my profile picture is a puffin. Right. And that is it. So I guess time to hand back to Michael. Thanks very much, John. Uh, really, really wonderful, wonderful photos as ever. Really, really fascinating. I've really enjoyed looking at those. And uh, thank you also for the video workshops. Um, uh, if for people watching at home, if you if you missed the detail on those, then uh, you'll be able to watch them again uh, when we when the YouTube video uh, appears on the Discover Lundy uh, website. We were not. It sometimes takes a while for the video to appear properly, so I'll post the link up in the usual places. And I don't know, John, if you want to post those videos separately, uh, we we can talk about that offline. But uh, if yeah. we do if we do put the videos up separately, we we can uh, send an email around and put the information up on Facebook. We've got a few questions in already. So uh, if you've got a question for John, then uh, please do pop it in the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of the screen. Uh, I'm going to go to Clive Smith, uh, who's got the first question again. Clive was a, a regular first question asker uh, in the early days of these webinars. It's the first time we've heard from Clive in a while. Clive says, uh, love your photos and always enjoy to see you posting in the Facebook group. In order to get a picture that represents what was there rather than the auto-corrected version from the camera, what settings do you use? And uh, Clive also adds that he's got a Canon EOS 700D, so I hope you know what that means. Okay, so hi Clive, you've got a good camera, as I'm sure you know. Um, I set my camera to manual, so on the dial on the top it will say M, M for manual. Uh, I will set the ISO as low as I can. So if it's daylight, you might set it to 250. But without getting technical, you might then try an aperture of maybe f8. And you might then try playing around with your shutter speeds. And the beauty of digital is that you can play back on the back of the, the camera. And you can see if the picture is too bright or too dark. So don't be afraid to let the pictures be too dark. What I always say to people and what I always say to students is, you know, you've got a digital camera there. We're not restricted to 24 pictures or 36 pictures. Uh, you can take thousands. So just just take loads and you'll find which, which exposures actually work. Thank you, John. Uh, just a few comments that have come in. Uh, so Dave Bennett mentions that Affinity Photo is an excellent Photoshop alternative. Have you heard of that, John? I haven't, no. Um, the only one I use with my students is Pixel R, and we started that during lockdown. And it was, my, it was one of my colleagues at, at work who said, have you thought about this? And I ummed and awed. I looked at it. I thought, yeah, it's fine, actually. But I'll look at that, Dave. Thank you for the for the message. 
Uh, and uh, Dave and I posted the links for um, the free trial of Photoshop and the oh, link brilliant. for Pixelar in, in the chat so people can pick those up there. Uh, Sue, Sue and Jim Maguire say, thanks for the link. And John, your photography is inspiring. Cheers. Thank you. Uh, we've got a few more comments. Uh, those Christmas, those Clive Smith again, those Christmas Day sunrise photos are amazing. Uh, really, really good. Uh, Jill Brown asks, uh, hi, John, great photos as always. Are you editing the raw files before saving to JPEGs? Uh, probably for the, last, there. for the last nine or 10 years, I just take them in JPEG now. If I think it's something that I want to spend time editing. So there's times when, for example, I don't tend to do it now, but I do a picture of the sea coming in around Rock Island, I would use RAW, I'd set the camera to RAW because I'd blend different images together. Um, but I very rarely blend images together, so I just use JPEG. I can see very little difference in the quality. And I've got images that have been printed to six foot across uh, that I've taken in RAW and I've taken in JPEG. And when they're printed, and I say they're six foot across, they're not pictures of Lundy, they're just pictures of you know schools and, and whatnot. I can't tell the difference between a RAW and a JPEG. I think a RAW or an NEF, if it's Nikon, gives you more latitude in theory, but I use curves constantly and that seems to compensate for it. And it just makes the whole editing process a little bit more straightforward for me. But I hope that's answered your question. If people are comfortable using RAW, then carry on using RAW. You know, I use JPEG because it just suits me. Thanks, John. Uh, our next question is from Carol Lee. Hello, Carol. Um, uh, this, is, this is a really good question. I like this. So it's so easy to get carried away tinkering with the photo, trying to get it just so. Uh, any tips on how to curb one's enthusiasm to attain that unattainable per perfection? And how do you no. decide to say that that'll have to do and stop? No. <laughs> All I'd say is, and I said it in the vids, is save more than one version. And what I tell students is that, you know, don't play around with the photos, but on the day you play around with the photo, don't think that's got to be it. Because the next week or the next month or the next year, you might be in a different place in terms of your mood or whatever. And you might think of something else. You might see it differently and you might want something differently. So I can't answer the question or I can't give sound advice. I can just say there isn't a stopping point. Just carry on editing, but save those different versions. Uh, and that way you can literally go wherever the mood takes you. Okay. Good advice. Good advice. Thank you. Um, just a few more things from the chat. Uh, Debbie Fraser says, brilliant atmospheric photos. Uh, Susan O'Grady, thank you, John. Really enjoyed that. Uh, and we've got, uh, who's this from? I can't quite read it. Uh, Alicia Clark says, hi, John. Alicia and Chris here. Lundy Castle Cottagers over Christmas. <laughs> it was great to catch that sunrise uh, photo of you taking your pictures on Christmas morning in front of Castle Cottage. There we go. Yeah. So you've tracked you've tracked down some of the residents of the castle on Christmas. Oh, that's Day. great. That's great. Uh, I'm sure they saw the sunrise too. Uh, I know I did, but I was in the radio room, so I was just really lucky. I just happened to look out the window at about seven forty-five on Christmas morning, and then fing, I was out the door. But it really <laughs> was sensational. Uh, let's move on to our next question. Uh, Richard Lowe's says, "Thank you, John. That was." Very and as always, some stunning pictures. This is probably a silly question. I'm a complete novice, but when photographing a landscape, would you ever use a flash? Uh, yeah. I would use a flash if there's something in the foreground. So one of those pictures of the cross in the cemetery, I used a fill-in flash just because the light was behind, uh, or the, the sunlight was in front of me. So what I wanted to photograph would have been almost a silhouette. It would have been in shadow. So I used a fill-in flash just to highlight, um, well, the front of, 
of the cross or the gravestone. So yes, very rare occasion. Be careful with flash in a landscape because you know the flash only travels so far. And if, for example, if it's a misty day, all the flash is going to do is reflect back the mist and the water droplets or the water vapor more than you can see with the human eye. Uh, so you end up just getting these white photos. But yeah, you can use flash. I don't use it hardly at all. Um, but again, you know, if I was photographing, say, a tree in the foreground, I might consider using flash, but fill in flash to balance the tones between the foreground and the background, like people do with portraits. You know, you can stand your granny or your auntie or your mother-in-law in front of wherever, and you might use a flash. So hope that answers your question. Thanks, John. Uh, the next question's from Katie Scorgi. Uh, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, fantastic demonstration on editing and really superb photos. Uh, how often do you take the perfect photo that doesn't need any editing? I've never taken a perfect photo. Good question, Katie. Hi. I think if I took a perfect photo, I could retire from trying to take photos. And I think it's what keeps people going. I know Katie, and she's an artist. She specializes in equestrian art. And it would be the same for her, I'm sure. When she paints a perfect picture, as she sees it, she can retire. So it's what keeps, and I love seeing people on Lundy with cameras uh, because it shows they're looking and it shows they're feeling something back from the landscape or the seascape or whatever it is. Uh, a message here from, it says Jane here, spent an afternoon with you looking for the hind calls and enjoyed <laughs> learning about aperture and speed. <laughs> uh, yeah, she was a quick learner. <laughs> Uh, Liz Smith says, thanks, John. Fantastic photos. We love the hammer shot. Uh, we stayed there in September. Did you see the hammer's dash? No. I'm I not sure I know what is. the hammer's dash is. Although, I don't know uh, what it is. <laughs> I wonder is it whether it's like the... Is it something we can talk about? Uh, I'm not, I yeah, know. I'm not sure. It might be like the, uh, it like, might be like the Tibbet's dash. Yeah, that's one way, isn't it? The Tibbet's dash. <laughs> Uh, Ian Campbell says, as a very amateur photographer, I've been inspired by your photos. Thanks for sharing your professional skills with us. Uh, and Neil Thomas says, uh, great shots, John. You've reminded me how much I miss Lundy. Uh, I have many shots from, the, from Christmas past. Uh, and he adds that January on the Ringing World calendar, so for all the bell ringers out there who've got the Ringing World calendar, the January picture is of Lundy, and it was a photo that Neil took on, on, on a Christmas day. Cool. Um, I've got one more question here from Grant Cousins. So um, there aren't any more questions in the moment, so do pop your question in into the Q&A if you've got any. Uh, otherwise, we will wrap up shortly. So uh, Grant asks, uh, how often do you use long shutter speeds in landscape photos? Uh, there was one, so the one from the battery that was kind of green and dramatic and rainy, that was probably a 15th of a second. But unless you want to kind of make the water look like cotton, for example, when you might be using an exposure of a minute, uh, that's the only time I really use long shutter speeds. The picture from the battery that you saw, that was a long exposure because I didn't want to bash up the ISO and lose quality. I wanted maximum quality. Uh, and I had a tripod, which I never carry a tripod. I had a tripod with me because I was using a GoPro for time lapses. I don't like a tripod because I think it slows everything down. Um, so in answer to the question, very rarely... Uh, there were some pictures when I first started photographing Lundy in 2010. There were a lot of images I took using a tripod and a one minute exposure or less, uh, just trying to capture the waves. There was one that worked and one that I was happy with. And that's one of the ones that's going to be sold uh, online via the shop in a week or two's time. Sorry about the shameless bit of advertising there. Perfectly allowed. <laughs> 
Uh, we've got no more questions, so just a couple more comments. Uh, Joanne Wilby, hello Joanne, uh, says, I'm glad you admit to taking lots of photos of the church every time you go. I have countless photos of the same scene and not just at different times of the year. Uh, David Can also adds, uh, love the shot of the cross with the church in the far distance. Uh, oh, and Sally Jenkinson says, thank you, another great webinar. Th thanks for your comments, Sally. That's good, thank you, thank you. So I think it's uh, time to start wrapping up then. So um, of course uh, I'm going to do my. You've done your plug for your for your photos in the Lundy shop. I'm going to do my plug for the Lundy Field Society. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I I'm not, I can't actually get my screen share to work at the moment. So um, just usually I usually at this point show a show a show a slide of the about the Lundy Field Society and encourage uh, all our audience uh, if they've not already joined the Lundy Field Society uh, to join. Um, you can go to the Lundy Field Society website lundy.org.uk. Uh, membership is open to all, uh, and your subscriptions directly support uh, the conservation work that the LFS does on Lundy, and of course it uh, it's. Uh, sponsoring these talks as well so uh, please do support us um, i would normally also at this point tell you about the uh, the next talks that are coming up i don't actually have any dates for any future talks at the moment i'm working on the february webinar uh, i have a, a an inquiry out to a potential speaker but i haven't had a reply yet uh, and i'm also working on the march webinar so as soon as i have details of future talks i will put that up uh, on Facebook and I will also email it round to LFS members. Uh, I'm just spotting a few more things coming in the chat. I think they're just thank you messages. Uh, oh, somebody, somebody's joined the LFS, so that's great. <laughs> I can, yeah, I saw that. I, can, I saw one from Eva Bozinska as well, who asked if I only ever photograph Lundy. <laughs> uh, yes, really. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I didn't ask that question because uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was a Lundy webinar. I thought I thought uh, I thought we yeah. should uh, stick to the Lundy theme. <laughs> well, I photographed some cows recently. That was good. <laughs> okay, so um, just to the final bits of wrap up then. So uh, as usual, when when we get to the end of this session, uh, a feedback survey will pop up. Uh, so please do complete this feedback survey. I'm really grateful for the feedback that we receive and it helps me uh, make any changes to, to the format or, or make adjustments. But generally, uh, we have some really fantastic, uh, very encouraging feedback. So thank you for taking the time to fill in the uh, survey form. Thanks also to Dave Richards for hosting us this evening. Thank you, John, for a fascinating talk uh, and demonstrations of the videos as well. I think we, we've tested a little bit more of additional technology, uh, something we haven't done before. Uh, I've really enjoyed myself, uh, but before I, before I uh, sign off, do you want to say cheerio to the audience, John? Yeah, thank you, Michael, and thanks for watching, everybody, and see you on Lundy. Cheers. I look forward to seeing you on Lundy as well uh, soon, John. Uh, and that's it from me. As I say, I'll let you know when the next webinar, the date of the next webinar will be sometime in February. I hope